sometimes life doesn't go like that. I would be actually relieved because I like them. I should look up how to say this. Very mixed bag is what I'm saying. The cilantro was strong with this one. <laughs> Welcome to my January wrap up, the first wrap up of 2023. I have a lot of books and this stack is very precarious. Oh, I forgot to put in my stack. I have two DNFs for the year. I might have to go get those. But anyway, um, I don't count those toward my reading goal anyway. So red books, I have 15 books. Um, holy moly. This is also the first time I'm using a new camera to film a video, so I'm really hoping this is going well. I mean, I'm assuming if you're hearing me say these words, it went well, but if not, then editing me, hi, this didn't go well, and you're gonna have to re-record this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, cool. I'm mostly just thinking about my camera right now, to be perfectly honest, but I've, I'm, I have things to tell you about books. Oh, and also, Year of Game, it's still happening. I have scripted my Neverwhere review, and I keep hoping to, like, film it, but I haven't had time to do that. I'm very fairly <laughs> decently confident that the very next video after this one that I post will be my Neverwhere review. I have yet to record it, but I have it scripted. I just need to pull, there's some quotes I still need to pull and then I'll be all ready to film it and, and post it. So that's coming. I, I wanted to post it in January. I wanted to post each game and book in the month that I'm reading it, but sometimes life doesn't go like that. January wrap up, yes, let's do it. I will go get my DNFs. Uh, it occurs to me that my child, my furry baby is locked in the bedroom so that she won't mess with my new camera and uh, my DNFs are in there. So instead, please enjoy these graphics that I have pulled from the internet. So I believe the first book that I DNF'd um, was Age of Myth by Michael J. Sullivan. And uh, Jashana, if you're watching this, I would just like you to know that I have valued our friendship and um, I'm very sorry to lose that relationship. Uh, it's meant a lot to me, so I'm sorry that this has to be where we part. But yeah, uh, Age of Myth is a... Uh, I've my Michael J. Sullivan story. The first Michael J. Sullivan book I ever bought was Age of Myth because I saw the cover and this was like pre-booktube or very early booktube. Anyway, so I got Age of Myth and then after getting, uh, after getting it, after getting it, I learned that it was a prequel to the Ryuria Chronicles. So I was like, oh shoot. So then I went and bought all of the Ryuria Chronicles. And then I found out that the Ryuria Chronicles are actually prequels for the Ryuria Revelations. So I was like, Okay, so I bought all of the Ryuria Revelations and I've read the Ryuria Revelations. I did not love them, but I also own all of the Age of Legends. Age of Legends? Is that what it's called? It's not called that. Legends of the First Empire, I believe. That's what Age of Myth is the first book in. I own all of those in hardcover. They're so beautiful. Honestly, such nice cover art. Like not just for the first book, all the books. Anyway, um, yeah, I didn't love Revelations, but it was the first thing he had written, like chronologically speaking, or like publication order speaking, chronologically speaking, Age of Myth is first. <laughs> Jashana and Jesse and I think other people also had expressed that while they liked the Rayuria books, they thought that the Legends of the First Empire is like his best. It's just like a lot, lot better than the Rayuria stuff. And I was like, well, Rayuria stuff wasn't bad. It was like far from my favorite, but like it was, it had some good stuff in there. And maybe what I didn't like about it was just kind of like, him being an amateur like that was the first thing he wrote in age of myth i started reading it and i was like this is the same this is no better no different in fact it's slightly worse than rayuria revelation um especially because it's supposed to be taking place like thousands of years before rayuria revelations and the world and the tone and the like time period feel no different and rayuria already feels slightly modern and it's like kind of jokey and bantery and quippy and a very modern casual like windowpane prose kind of way, which is like, it's not my preferred, but like I can like a book that's like that. And it works better for me in Ray Ray Revelations because Hadrian and Royce are kind of this like buddy cop heisting duo. So like that they have this like bantery jokey relationship. It's like, it's fine. I actually started liking the series less and less because it kind of got more and more epic. And I just didn't think it was handling it well because it was kind of keeping that jokey tone, but like also trying to be epic. And I was like, I just don't really take any of this seriously and the world building's not that good. So thousands of years before this, the tone is the same. Hadrian and Royce could like show up at any point and it would feel entirely appropriate. I would be actually relieved because I like them. And that's the thing too. Everybody that praises Legends of the First Empire is like, oh, it's the characters. I love the characters. Well, in fairness, I did DNF the book, but like so far I was not impressed with the characters. <laughs> I was like, I just, I don't think this is going to be for me. I could keep reading this and maybe it gets a bit better, but I'm just like I don't think this is gonna be for me and I was keeping all of those books all my Michael J. Sullivan books because I was like well my ego was fine but like man I'm so looking forward to Legends of the First Empire and once I become a huge fan of that I will want to have a complete like full Michael J. Sullivan collection and um I don't I don't like Legends of the First Empire and I don't feel any kind of attachment to Ryuria 
So I think I'm unhauling 15 books, 16 books, something like that. Cause I'm, I'm gonna get rid of all of it. So anyway, <laughs> that was my first DNF of the year. And the other DNF was like way faster. I gave Age of Myth a bit of a chance. Cause I was like, I own all of them. <laughs> but the other one, um, I really, I didn't even think I would like it, but I, Alcray was doing these like uh, Lord of the Rings inspired little ceramic bowls. And at Christmas, like they had a big sale of like merch that had been in boxes where you could just buy the merch. So I had bought the three that they had, which were like Rivendell, Erebor, and the Shire. Now after that, and you could not buy it separately, they're like, I think they're January box or the December box or whatever. The whole box that comes with the book and like other merch in it, they did the fourth and final bowl, which is Gondor. And I looked online to see if people were reselling it because um, I was like, I just want the bowl. That's all I want. And I did find some people reselling the bowl, but they were asking like the almost exact same amount as it is to just buy the box. And they did still have the box. It wasn't like sold out because if it had been sold out, I'd be like, well, I guess I'm paying a box amount for a bowl. They still had lots. Or I don't know if they have lots, but they still had in stock the whole box. So I was like, well, I could pay this amount and just get the bowl or I could pay this amount and like get some other stuff too including a book that I might like. So I got the box and I love the bowl. The bowl's amazing. The Gondor one's my favorite. But so the book that was in the box was The Luminaries by Susan Dennard. And I tried reading the, the Witchlands series because Bethany loves it so much before. And I did own like several of them and I did not like that series. It was not for me. But The Luminaries is like years later now and it's like supposed to be quite different. It's not part of the Witchlands at all. And I was like, I mean, sure. Like I probably wouldn't have bought this myself, but like it came in this box. So I was like, sure, let's let's give it a go. I quickly DNF'd it. I was like, oh yeah, no, this is not for me. I know immediately. It was like even more YA in tone than the Witchlands ever had been. And it was just more amateurish than the Witchlands was. And it felt so YA and so derivative and so like quippy in the way that it felt like a CW show, but a CW show that gets canceled. Cause like I can, I watch CW shows. I admit that freely. I, Riverdale is one of my all time favorite shows of all time ever. I have no shame about that. I watched a, like the first four seasons, I think, of The Vampire Diaries. What else is on the CW? There's probably others. I don't know, point being like, just because something is on the CW, just because it's like, you know, kind of campy and over the top and derivative and quippy. And I tend to prefer that on screen than in books because on screen it's easier to convey camp. But I mean, yeah, I can like a book that's like kind of that way. Like something reminding you of a CW show, it's not necessarily gonna be a turn off for me. But yeah, this is like what a CW show that like gets immediately canceled. <laughs> So yeah, I, I very quickly DNF'd it. I was like, yeah, no. So anyway, um, those are my DNFs. Let's talk about the books that I actually read, like finished in January. The first book that I read and finished um, was The Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls. I think I put this on my DVR. If I didn't, yeah, I did, right? Because this was my uh, December uh, book of the month club box. Um, this and my other ones in there as well. So I always try to read it in the following month. And the only reason I got this was because at the end of the year, if you've like finished the reading challenge, then actually I think maybe everyone gets to. I'm not sure if you have to beat the reading challenge or not, but you get to pick one of the year's finalists for like best book of the year for free. And the finalists I had already, for all of them I had already gotten it or I wasn't interested in it at all. The only one that I had not gotten and was mildly interested in was this one. So I was like, okay, Lincoln Highway. And I really loved it. I need to like really like force myself to not pick the speculative books from Book of the Month because those are never good. But they always are the ones that most appeal to me, the cover and the, the like synopsis. They're never good. The only times I've loved Book of the Month Club books is when they're like lit fic or thriller or things like that. So once again, <laughs> lit fic to save the day. I really, really, really loved this. It kind of reminded me of the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Which, um, is a favorite movie. I really like that movie. Anyone looking to pick this up, I don't want to give you a false impression. It's not exactly like that movie. That movie is a lot more like stylistic and over the top and, and campy and just more out there. But this does kind of like bring the like the sense of like a Greek odyssey or Greek stories or just like kind of old myth and legend and brings it in a kind of like very, I don't know, significant way to a story that's just in America that's about Americans, a young man and his brother and some other people. And there's a lot, it's a very character driven story. We're actually not on the Lincoln Highway that much in it. But yeah, it, it's just a people story from multiple perspectives, how they connect and intertwine. And you get to see this kind of like mosaic portrait of some pockets of America at a certain time. But yeah, I mean the main character, or I guess it is a, an ensemble, but I would say there's a main character, at least slightly more main character than the others. 
And like, he's just gotten out of prison at the beginning of the story, which again, reminds me of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And now they're gonna be traveling across America. This reminds me of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The younger brother is very much into like classics and he keeps like relating things in their lives to classics, which is what reminds me of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So yeah, I really, really enjoyed this and it's inspired me to wanna pick up more by Amor Tolls. I should look up how to say his name. I still don't know. I think I gave it four stars, not five, because the ending like didn't like fully come together for me the way that I would have wanted it to, but it was really, really good. Uh, next up was a reread, and that was Kingdoms of Death by Christopher Rocchio, because book five in The Sun Eater, which is next, was coming out and, or had just come out, and uh, Alex and I were doing um, a live show to chat about it. And um, if you don't know, Kingdoms of Death and Ashes of Man, those two books were originally one book that got split into two, and it had been a long time. I mean, I read this when it came out, so not that long, but it had, I read this when it came out, and I, the more I, when we were talking about it in my Discord, I was like, did I even read that book? I don't remember anything about it. One, I don't remember enough, and two, this is basically like the first half of this same book, so more so than before, I would like to read it like kind of back to back. So I reread this, and I'm glad I did because I liked it more the second time. The issues I had with the pacing and whatnot, just like, I don't know, maybe because I knew to expect them, they didn't bother me as much. So I enjoyed it more the second time. And then, like immediately thereafter, I dove into Ashes of Man by Christopher Rocchio. And I did have slightly more issues with this in terms of the tone of certain positions of the author becoming apparent. Alex and I will have our live show when this is going up like two days from today, from when you're seeing this. So I'm sure we'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, there were some, I mean, I'm vaguely aware of Christopher Rocchio's personal beliefs and leanings and like position on some things. And I don't think we like fully see eye to eye on things. And for the most part in the Sun Eater series, it's not like so much a part of it that like, it's like, you know, a deal breaker for me or that like it, it ruins the story for me. But there are times, especially in the like short stories and like extra world material, that it becomes quite apparent what his views are. Again, most of the time, either it's not affecting the story or when I do notice it, it's it's not such a huge part of the story to where it ruins it. I'm more just like observing it occurring in the story. And I'm like, I know why this is here, um, but moving on. <laughs> like I kind of note it and I'm like, mm, I don't agree, but then I move on because like, it's not integral to like the infrastructure of this story, but it was a little bit more so, a little more prominent, um, a little harder to ignore in Ashes of Man. But that said, I still give this five stars because I really, really enjoyed it. And where it's going, I'm very intrigued. I'm concerned about where it's going, not because there's been any bad signs or, well, there's been a little bit. If ultimately where we go with this, like the answer to like the big mysteries that have been building throughout these books, if the answer to those questions, to the answer to those mysteries is hugely leaning into his personal views and personal beliefs, well then that will kind of retroactively kill the series for me. But so far, it's just been kind of like, it's, it's like that one seasoning in a dish that you wish wasn't in it, but it's still a yummy meal. It's it's like me and cilantro. I love Mexican food. I eat Mexican food all the time. And they always put cilantro in everything. And I hate cilantro, it tastes like soap, but I still eat Mexican food. And I'm just like, mm, that bite was a little bit soapy, <laughs> moving on. So that's kind of me and the like the parts of this that I'm like, I don't think I agree with the author about. I read it and I'm like, there was the cilantro, but moving on. So like if the ending is just a big old pile of cilantro, we're gonna have a problem. <laughs> but so, so far it's apparent, but like it doesn't bother me yet. I'll look forward to chatting with Alex about this book. Next up is another book that you will see me chatting about soon. And that is The Forgetting Moon by Brian Lee Durfee, the first book in the Five Warrior Angels, which um, I am doing a buddy read read along with Aaron from Books and Busy. And the live show for this will be soon. I don't think I know the date right now. Um, any who sees this book is massively long. <laughs> And this did have some problems for me. I think I gave it three stars because the things that it did badly, it, it did quite bother me, but the things that it did well were well enough for me to, like that's how much it was able to balance it out because the good stuff was quite good. So like it averages out to a three. Like that's how good the good stuff was, if that makes sense. So what it does badly, I think is representations of females and exposition. Those things I think it does extremely, extremely poorly. Um, I, as a fantasy reader, I read a lot of books that handle those two things in particular quite badly. And so the reason that I'm still quite excited 
to read the next book is what I've heard about where this goes, what I've heard about like what happens and and where some of these things, how they, some of these things get subverted and, and complicated in the next book. So I'm very excited to see that. But yeah, so like with exposition in particular, um, basically if you're info dumping stuff to me, I will never like that you're info dumping stuff to me. Or if you're having like really expository dialogue where it's like two characters are like this thing that you of course have heard of. Oh yes, this thing that I have heard of, that's the thing that does X, Y, Z. Isn't that so? Yes. And don't forget it also does this thing. And you're like, no one talks like this. Like you're saying this because the reader will learn what this is or like literal just paragraphs that are just like telling you, like we're just like pausing the story to tell you stuff. Like I will hate that always. I would much rather be confused about what's going on in this scene than have you pause the scene to tell me what's going on. That's just me as a reader. I will, I will never like it if you info dump to me or have a painfully unnatural sounding expository dialogue. I will never like that. If you do it a lot, because like some books, you know, like you get that out of the way because it kind of like caught you up on the situation and then off we go. I'll be like, okay, well, I, I promise you could have delivered that more organically, but fine, we did it. We got the info dumped. We're doing the story now. Like just got through that, moving on. If your book is like a ton of info dumping all of the time, there's never a point where we've caught up where we are continuing to constantly dump more and more information, then I better think your information is interesting. That's the only thing that can save it. Most of the time, I don't. Most world building out there, it's not that interesting. It's pretty derivative or the author like that's you like now I'm thinking about the author anytime you info dump something to me you, know, you can see the author's hand in it that's when you're aware that the author is speaking to you is when something is being info dumped and so then I'm also thinking about the author now and I'm thinking about how this author thinks they're so clever and I will always be annoyed by that <laughs> so that's just like you're calling attention to yourself and to your world building and most of the time your world building is like not nearly as clever as you think it is. So basically yeah, if you're info dumping information to me I better be really into it. I better really love the world that you're telling me about where I'm able to forgive that you're dumping it to me like this. And like to be perfectly honest The Wolf by Leo Carew and all three of those books but particularly The Wolf he does info dump a lot. Y'all know how much I love The Wolf. I've read it seven times and I will read it seven more times and I would give it six out of five stars. I fucking love the wolf and it, it info dumps. So I'm saying like it is possible for me to not just forgive it, but like give it a, a complete pass if I love what you're telling me. And I'm not saying that I <laughs> that this is a, a new wolf. I would have given it five stars, not three. But what I'm saying is I did think it was interesting. I do think the world building is decently interesting. I do think that the history of this world is decently interesting. I do think that the mysteries it's setting up are decently interesting. Enough for me to go, I don't like how you're telling me this. And I don't like what you're doing with your female characters, but I am interested. I am. I will keep reading. I mean, I have to keep reading because of the read along, but like, even if I, there was no read along, I would read the next book. Despite its flaws, I am interested. It is pretty good. The world building and like the mystery of what's going on and, and where we're going to go with that. So very mixed bag is what I'm saying. <laughs> next up is one of the biggest disappointments of the year for me and that is Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. I wrote a pretty scathing review on Goodreads. I did give this three stars but it was more like a 2.5 rounded up and most of that 2.5 is just like cashing out the goodwill that it earned from me for Ninth House. So this if you don't know this is the sequel to Ninth House. Ninth House was already like a shaky start but like a promising one in my opinion. I thought you know, it was it was it was hard getting into it. I identified some pacing issues that I thought would have like structuring the story differently would have helped you to like be more immediately invested in it. But like by the end of Ninth House, I was like, okay, but I do want to see where this goes. You have me now. You have me quite hooked. And Hellbent is like doing everything that Ninth House did badly, but even more so, and then doing some new things like some fresh bad stuff that like Ninth House didn't even do. The world building is all over the place with this. The pacing is terrible. The plot is like, I mostly compare this. I don't think I did in my Goodreads review, but I've like when I've spoken to people about it, the most, this most reminds me of Rise of Skywalker, the Star Wars movie, in the way that it's just like, it's like nonstop fetch quests and just like, we gotta find the MacGuffin, do the magic thing, here's a ritual, here's a scroll, here's a book, we gotta find it, we gotta look at it, we gotta do it, we gotta get out of it, like just constantly. And a bit of that, sure, that's a bit of adventure. That's that's what your plot is, ostensibly. That's how you learn world building. But it's just like this complete grab bag of nonsense world building so that we can constantly be going from thing to thing to thing because God forbid we stop for a moment to like actually deal with the ramifications and the emotional fallout of the stuff that's supposedly happening to our characters, which is weighty. Like it's not nothing that's happening to these characters. There's some pretty intense stuff that's happening to these characters, but I feel nothing about it because we're just like, this thing was super intense and I'll probably never be the same again. Anyway, on to the next fetch quest. Like, and that's not what I read books for personally. I'm a character driven reader. I would much rather have like, you know, 90% less fetch quests. Just have the one 
really significant one and like spend the book building up to this little ritual we need to do and slowly gather what we need for it and figuring it out and really like sitting with the feelings and emotions and relationships that are affected by it. That's what I'd like to read, not whatever this is. And like to be perfectly frank too, like the macabre imagery of it was at times kind of ridiculous <laughs> where it was like more funny than horrifying to me. I was like, are you hearing us right now? <laughs> this cover is like so cool and so sinister. Reminds me of the cover for What Moves the Dead. What Moves the Dead is creepy as fuck. That is sinister. This is also like a CW show, but a, a, a bad one. Next up is my other book of the month club book. And that was The Circus Train by uh, Amita Parikh. And this was not good. This was very surface level, almost offensively so, because it's dealing with like so many different things. And I feel like the author didn't have the space or time to really do justice to any of those things and then ended up telling like a schlocky Hallmark channel kind of story instead because we wanted to have like happy endings and good good vibes. But we're dealing with like horrifying parts of actual history as well as like really serious things that affect and have affected real people. There's not really any circus in this if you're expecting like, ooh, it'll be like the night circus. Ooh, it'll be like, I don't know, what's another work with a circus in it? I don't know, there's another one, isn't there, that people talk about? I don't know. But if you're expecting circus vibes, like, nope, not a lot of that. The disability rep in it is, um, would have bothered me anyway. And then when I saw also what people had to say about it, people who are disabled and how we're like, um, no, we're not, we don't like this. But it even, it's just kind of like put words to a vibe that I had where I was like, something, something about this. Like, I don't, I don't know why I don't like this. I don't like what this is doing. This doesn't, this feels off to me. And I wouldn't have been able to tell you why, but like, but yeah, seeing reviews from people who are disabled saying, this is why this is not okay. I was like, okay, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that was why the vibes were off. <laughs> so yeah, and it like glosses over the Holocaust in a way that it's like, it's like the Hallmark Channel version of the Holocaust, which is like, ah, that, hmm. you know, you don't have to write about the Holocaust. You know, you don't. If you don't want to write a story that's going to like handle it, with the weight and gravity that it deserves, then just maybe don't touch it, you know? Maybe, possibly. So yeah, like I, I get what the author was trying to do. And I did like, there was an interview with the author as well that I like, I just, like I get what she was going for. And I know why she was going for those different things and what she thought she was doing. But like, this wasn't it. Next up was another book that I did not care for. <laughs> that was The Winter King by Bernard Cornwell, which was my, well, technically my first Bernard Cornwell book that I have finished, but I have started like reading some other Cornwell books which is good because those other Cornwall books I like a lot better. Whereas if I had just read this and not touched anything else, I probably would have never tried again. But like concurrently, I was like picking up a bunch of different Cornwalls and this was one that I like had to read for this month. So I finished it. The other two, I don't have to have read in January. So I was like, I'll finish y'all at another time. Winter King, I was like, this is the worst by far of the ones that I'm like reading at the same time. I have a review on Goodreads for it. But basically like, what did I say? This is like if, if Harry Potter was told by Seamus Finnegan, by which I mean the main character, the, the character that's telling you the story has like no, is, is like hardly important to the story and not really present for a lot of important things. So it's like, why is he telling the story? Like I feel no investment in this and I'm also not getting very interesting information about it because he like wasn't there. He wasn't in the room where it happened. It, it's like this like 30,000 foot overview of stuff. We kind of breeze by stuff. The like action and battle stuff kind of happens off screen. The stuff it's doing with the like characters from the Arthur myth is not terribly interesting. Maybe it gets very interesting and subverted. I have heard that it does get interesting and subverted in the following books, but not in this one. The one that it does subvert in this one is Lancelot in a way that I don't like. Not really, I mean, I don't really personally like feel any kind of way about Lancelot where I'm like, Lancelot's my favorite character, how dare you? Like, I don't care honestly about the Arthur story that much. I just think it's really uninteresting and annoying and unbelievable what was done with Lancelot. I was like, well, don't like that. And like Arthur is like kind of too perfect. So like I would prefer an Arthurian story that's like subverting stuff to like make him unlikable because he is already the heroic, like mythic figure. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like. Okay, this book confirms Arthur was a special dude. Like, great, <laughs> cool. And then like, there's so much um, sexual violence in this book to the point, and it's not handled with care. And it feels gratuitous and unnecessary. And it feels like half the scenes, the author was like, hmm, the scene needs something. Hmm, need something to spice it up a little bit. Hmm, I know, rape. <laughs> it's just exhausting after a while. It's, it's not even that I'm reading it being like horrified and upset, I'm just like, for real? Again? And the, the way that it depicts pagans, again, I don't find it personally offensive. 
I'm just like, I, p pagans weren't just like doing like wild banana stuff for no reason. It's like the author thinks that because this is the Dark Ages and because they were pagans, he can just write any old kind of wild nonsense that occurs to him. And it's like, no, that's not how that works. So yeah, no, I don't like this. I own the other two, so I might read them. But I definitely will read more Cornwell because I've seen him do a lot better. This is, I don't get why people hype this at all. This is not for me. Next up, I have Nine Liars by Maureen Johnson. And I was really excited for this because I really like the Truly Devious books. This is another Truly Devious, like in the world of Truly Devious, like the, the Truly Devious mystery was already solved in that three book arc, but there's other books with the same character. So Box in the Woods came out last year, I think. It was okay. And this is another story with the same characters that are from Truly Devious. I was so pumped for this because, well, one, the cover is orange and covered with fall leaves. And it's like, I mean, yes. And then it takes place in like an old, house in England. It's like an isolated closed circle mystery. At least that's how it's pitched. And I was like, knives out in England. <laughs> yes. But it actually really doesn't. Um, it's not so much an isolated closed circle mystery and a cool old house vibe. Like they are briefly in the house. It's more about the characters and like their problems and the mystery kind of takes a backseat to that. And I'm mostly interested in the mystery. Or like that's what I would come to this book for with some like fun character vibes on the side. And... Yeah, the character stuff is kind of getting old because it feels like these are the same problems they've been having for all of the books. And it's like, you know, let, let's resolve it or move on or, or something like. And then the, the quippy bantery stuff, like sometimes it was funny. Like that's why these books, why I generally like them because the humor does generally work for me. But like, yeah, this just like wasn't that interesting or that good or that compelling. And I'm, I'm just kind of getting sick of it. And it wasn't a fun isolated closer real mystery like I wanted. And the character stuff, yeah, like I said, it's just kind of getting old. And then also, I've listened to this on audiobook. This takes place in England. And our main character and her friends, they're not English. They're the same kids from the Truly Devious. But where they, like everyone there who's involved in the mystery, this new mystery, they're all English. They're all from England. And there's lots of flashbacks for their mystery that are like just them. There's like lots of people that are supposed to have British accents. And the, the narrator cannot do an English accent to save her life. It was so painful to listen to this. So that certainly did not help matters. But I, I don't think I would have given this book like five stars if I'd read it physically instead of on audio. But like, reader be warned. The audiobook, like if you are tuned to accents at all, and that will bother you, it's bad. It's really bad. So anyway, this was pretty lackluster and disappointing. And I don't know if I'll read any more Truly Devious books if she publishes more. I mean, the way the character stuff went, I'm assuming she does want to publish more Truly Devious stories because it is not resolved, what our character stuff. And I just, I just don't care anymore, I don't think. Next up, I have The Last Wish, which is the short story collection before the other short story collection before the main Witcher series. Because on Chapter 3 Podcast, we were doing a read-along for the Witcher series. So we did have our live show talking about The Last Wish. If you missed it, I'll leave a link down below, uh, which was a great conversation. And our bonus content for patrons of the podcast was to do with fairy tales and fairy tale retellings and how fairy tales function in our collective consciousness because of fairly obvious reasons if you have read The Last Wish. So anyway, um, this was a reread for me. Uh, it was also a reread for Bethany. Um, the rest will be new for her rereads for me. I really, really love rereading this. I kind of miss being in the world of The Witcher. The way the series ends kind of left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth because I didn't love the way the series ends, the main books. Um, I don't hate it. I have generally fond feelings towards Witcher, but like it kind of fizzled for me a bit. I did not feel very enthusiastic about it by the end. So being back where it started, where I was giving these five stars, because I loved it the first time I read it and I definitely loved it again. So it was nice just kind of being in the world with Geralt, doing some monsters and some moral conundrums and just kind of vibing in the world of the Witcher. So I had a great time, great time chatting, and I'm very excited to read Sword of Destiny in February. Next up is Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. This is my third time reading it and I will have a review for it. I will, it's scripted. I have it, I just need to like do it. <laughs> this has never been a favorite for me for many reasons and having read it three times, I think I've come to a more like firm understanding of why that is. So I can't wait to tell you about that in the review that is coming, I promise. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman is a book that I've read three times that I will tell you more about shortly. Next up is Lead in the Mist by Hope Mirrorless. And this was the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick, my pick, and me and the ladies all dressed up as Faye for the live show for it. So if you missed it, I'll leave that link down below. So you can see us all in costume chatting about this book. This was a unicorn in the sense that none of us hated it. Me and Bethany really loved it. Mara quite liked it. And Amanda was fine with it. No one hated it. So yay. <laughs> I really, really, really enjoyed this. Um, like I said, we had our live show talking about it for an hour or more. But um, 
yeah, I think this is a really interesting, strange, um, sweetly sinister little book. And I'm really glad that we read it. Well, I mean, I, I picked it. So like, thanks to me. Thank you to self for choosing it. But yeah, I had a really great time reading this. Um, so yeah, if you missed the live show, link down below. Next up is the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them, which of course I did. And that was Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which is a long book. And I had very mixed feelings about it. I've never read a book before where I'm like, there is neither characters that I care about nor a plot that is engrossing, but I still feel entertained and interested by this. So, I mean, I talked about it at length in the vlog for my patrons, but yeah, suffice to say, I did not love this, but I kind of get why it's so well known. I think it did some things quite brilliantly, but like the overall package isn't that great in my opinion. I think it has a lot of weak points and a lot of flaws, a lot of things that I think would improve it. Like I wanted to love it and I think it could be brilliant but it's a long way from being my favorite. <laughs> and next up is a reread for me, and that was Northern Lights by Philip Pullman, also known as The Golden Compass. We're doing a read along for these books on my Patreon, and um, I think we're all having a good time with this. We're gonna have our chat about it for the filming of this video that's happening tomorrow. Uh, it will have already happened, or is happening when you're seeing this. I loved it, gave it five stars. It was so nice being back in this world. Kind of like with Witcher where like the series kind of fizzles for me. So like going back to the beginning again was really nice to be like, oh yeah, I did really love the beginning though. So yeah, I love Lyra so much. Um, and I just like being in this world. I think it's very clever. And um, and yeah, I'm very happy to be rereading these books and I can't wait to chat about it with my patrons. Next up is the other ongoing read along with my Patreon and that is Book of the New Sun. We read Shadow of the Torturer. And this was my my second time reading it. These are rereads for me up until um, Citadel of the Autark. And while I was reading it, I was like, why didn't I give this five stars the first time? Because I, I it's on Goodreads, it's four stars. I was like, this is so brilliant. I mean, I remember liking it, but this is amazing. Truly the prose, like it's, there's moments of writing that are just like, I'm, a, I'm in awe. I was like, why didn't I give this five stars? And then we got to like all the like questionable depictions of females that are like in quick succession. And I was like, mm, there it is. <laughs> and it's like one or two of those. And I would be like, I'll still give it five stars, but there's too many. That's what I was thinking to myself at first when I was starting to get that. I was like, oh, okay, this might've been why, but you know, I think I could still give it five. And then I was like, and there, oh, there's more. Well, maybe I, I could, nope, there's, oh God, there's even more. No, oh, no. So yeah, that's not great. <laughs> But other, I mean, the good stuff is so good. So I'm excited to keep reading this and I do think it's brilliant. I really do. I just wish we didn't do so much of like the naked sexualized ladies. I don't like that. Anyway, I'm excited to chat about this with my patrons. And the last book that I squeezed into January, which I'll be chatting with without, chatting about with Alex. We chatting about with Alex is Queen Amid Ashes by Christopher Rocchio, which is a short story collection that includes Queen Amid Ashes. I only gave this three stars. These are, did I say in the world of the Sun Eater? If I didn't, this is in the world of the Sun Eater. That's, that's why we're talking about it with Ashes of Man. I did not like most of these stories. <laughs> and this more so than Ashes of Man, I was like, there's some stuff in there. I'm like, mm, there's not cilantro. This, this book is like mostly cilantro. So I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. There's still some decent stuff here. That's why it's three stars. Like I, I feel like being in the world, there's some interesting stuff, interesting expansion of stuff we've heard about. There were some characters we haven't seen that much in the main series that we got to see more of here and it was interesting to get that contact. But like the cilantro was strong with this one. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about it with Alex, see what he thought, see if he tasted all the cilantro that I did. Those are all the books that I read slash DNF'd in January. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Did, have you read these books? Do you want to read these books? Do you feel the same way as I do about these books? Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays at the Random House Bell Buffy Saturday, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. I'll see you when I see you.